today's program is focusing on railroads and the consequences of the increased shipment of fossil fuel by rail from the inland sites of the Powder River Basin and the back and oil fields to the coast. You've heard the whistles blowing, no doubt, and perhaps waited at the crossing while the 100-car train goes by. There is no doubt that fossil fuel shipments by rail are increasing in our state and our community. The numbers seem to change daily as new proposals come online and some proposals are dropped or denied. Today, we hope to discuss some of the consequences of these shipments. This program is meant to be educational. We hope you will lead with information that will help you understand what they're all about, their possible risks, benefits, and consequences. We had hoped to have a spokesman from Burlington Northern join this discussion today to offer their views, but our six attempts to find someone to speak did not come to fruition. We are happy to welcome Eric DePlace from Sightline Institute to speak to statewide rail issues and Shannon Wright from Community Wise Bellingham to explain about the local implications. We're going to start with Eric. Eric DePlace is a policy director at Sightline Institute, the Northwest's leading think tank on issues related to sustainability. A researcher, writer, speaker, and policy analysis, analysis, sorry, can't say that word. Eric spearheads Sightline's work on energy policy. He is known as a leading expert on coal and coal experts, uh, exports. Our regional and national media routinely cite his work, and he's widely sought after as a speaker, so we're very happy to have him here today. Please welcome Eric to City Club. Well, thank you so much for having me here today, and I'm uh, just flattered by the turnout. This is fantastic. Uh, I will do my very best to keep this to a concise 15 minutes. Um, the slideshow does matter, so if you can see the slideshow, it's always better to look at a screen than look at me. Uh, you'll find much prettier pictures up there, I think. Um, if you can't see it in the back, I will try to, uh, to explain what's on the slides. Uh, and I do like to start off by showing you a picture, uh, a map, and I'll show you it in a second, that is um, totally inaccurate, uh, wildly, um, you know, just wildly too simplistic. It misses a lot of nuance and important detail, and it's also 100% right. Uh, and, the, and the reason I like this map is because it illustrates what I take to be uh, a fundamental truth, a fundamental piece of context that we've often overlooked in the discussion we're having these days about coal and oil. So if you take a look at this map of the Pacific Ocean, on the far right hand side you can see in red um, illustrated three of the big fossil fuel deposits in the interior of the continent. The Canadian tar sands in the north, uh, the Bakken uh, shale oil fields in the center, uh, and to the south the Powder River Basin coal fields. Uh, now, all of these uh, uh, fossil fuel deposits are different, and there are lots of complexities about the nature of the movements for those. Um, but on some level, they're all unpopular, or they don't have a natural domestic market sufficient to what the energy companies would like. And on some level, uh, energy companies would like to take that stuff and move it to Asia. And so because of the geographic location of the Pacific Northwest, we find ourselves in this region in a very peculiar spot, a very peculiar spot nationally and globally. Uh, where we are now in this region, British Columbia, Oregon, and Washington, uh, considering whether or not to build a huge array of energy infrastructure projects, all basically intended to move fuel from the interior of the continent to the big energy markets uh, on, the, on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. So uh, I do like to start off this talk by kind of walking through just to explain um, the magnitude of these projects. If you think about oil pipelines, there are two major oil pipelines under consideration in British Columbia, the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline in the north, the Trans Mountain Expansion uh, in the south. This is a very contentious issue north of the border. Uh, there are um, at least six natural gas pipelines planned from the Rockies uh, to ports uh, on uh, the coast of British Columbia uh, and also in Oregon. Uh, there are actually more depending on how you do the counting. Um, these are all additional. There are coal ports. I think most folks in Bellingham have heard something about coal. Um, there are actually four proposals for new coal ports, three coal terminal expansion projects, again, all along this area. And then in addition to that, uh, we have seen a proliferation of oil by rail plans uh, develop. And we have now, I think, 11 uh, oil by rail terminals that, are either, that have either come online recently uh, or are planned for development in the near future. So what we're looking at really 
um, isn't just uh, one particular coal terminal at Cherry Point or one particular oil terminal at a refinery. Uh, it's an aggregate flow of fossil fuels that is, in pla that is planned, mostly not yet active, um, from the interior of the continent to the Pacific. And so it is that fundamental dynamic that I think we need to all keep in mind when we're considering um, the merits of any particular proposal. Now, the way Bellingham and Whatcom County have experienced this debate uh, has largely been uh, in view of the rail traffic. And so we've had a robust debate over coal for the last couple of years here and in other parts of the Northwest. And recently, uh, we've seen an increasing uh, interest in uh, these long black cylindrical uh, strings of, of tank cars uh, on oil trains, uh, which is a new development, but I think a, uh, a very, very interesting development. And I'm going to talk mostly about oil today and less about coal. Uh, other places are experiencing this fossil fuel debate in, in very different ways, but I am going to focus most of the talk today uh, on the impacts as they relate uh, to the rail lines. Um, and you know, I do like to put this slide up as well. There's a little something for everyone to hate, I like to say. Uh, and uh, I know that um, BNSF is not here to defend themselves, unfortunately. Uh, but there are a whole range of issues connected with fossil fuel transport um, that deserve airing or that are important uh, and are important in different communities and to different types of folks. I don't want to minimize any of those concerns. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about most of that stuff today, property values. I'm not going to talk about uh, most environmental impacts. I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about the risks uh, to the Salish Sea. Um, there are a whole bunch of very, very uh, important topics that I am going to completely overlook. Um, but what I will start with uh, is something that I think uh, most people can relate to, and that's simply doing the math uh, for vehicle delays and traffic congestion. Because this is uh, an issue that isn't really or shouldn't really be subject to a lot of dispute. Um, when you know where a coal terminal is located, or a planned coal terminal is located, and where oil terminals are located, it is relatively easy to then calculate how much vehicle traffic delay there will be. And the reason for that is that we know how much commodity they want to move and we know how many train cars you need to do it. So you kind of have a high school story but, or a high school story problem where you can sort of sit down and figure out, okay, well, if you know, a train is, let's say, 8,000 feet long or 8,500 feet long and it moves at 10 miles an hour, how long does it take to clear an intersection? And so we've just uh, uh, we've done the math here. Uh, and we've done this for every, uh, every county and every community in the state of Washington at Sightline. Uh, these are the numbers uh, that are relevant to Whatcom County and Bellingham. So these are the street closures you can look forward to uh, when the Gateway Pacific Terminal is built, when we have some Canadian uh, coal moving north, and when we have oil terminals. So this is actually, these are actually pretty conservative figures for some technical reasons I won't go into. The likely delays are probably longer than that. Um, and you can see that you know, they obviously vary depending on how fast the trains are moving. Um, so maybe you want really fast trains. Um, as it turns out, that's probably not a good idea, but, uh, uh, but it is worth pointing out that, um, and I, I, I don't mean to um, be presumptuous, most folks in Bellingham probably know where the at-grade rail crossings are, but in case you don't, I do think it's always worthwhile to point out that there are a whole bunch of them, uh, and a whole bunch of them in very important locations to this community, and in some of these locations, uh, as you go sort of north around um, Bellingham Bay, uh, are important not just to this community, but to um, their of larger state or regional interest. Uh, you've got basically 13 at-grade rail crossings within kind of the, more or less, the city proper. If you do a little bit of math um, to kind of figure out what it would cost, so we know, how, we know how the traffic delays are like, right? We know we could be looking at an hour, two hours, maybe, maybe two and a half, probably more than that delay, depending on what, how fast the trains are moving. That's kind, of the, that's kind of the risk of delay. That's an average figure on a daily basis. Fixing those problems uh, is costly, and so uh, I don't put a, have put a slide up about this, but let's just do a little thought experiment real quick. Uh, where I live in Seattle, uh, we have a very big problem with trains tying up our industrial and manufacturing. We have a big traffic problem in general. That's not a surprise. But we've got a really big problem in the offing with our industrial area. The South Lander Street crossing, which is right by Safeco Field, if you ever go to see a ball game, uh, we're looking at an overpass um, situation for that. It's $180 million for one at one problem. Now that's a complex industrial one. So these are not likely to be that expensive. But let's say the cost is less than a third. Let's say it's $50 million. And let's say we solve it for less than half. Let's say we solve it for six of the 13. And let's say BNSF is as generous as they, ever, as they could possibly be and kick in 5%. You kind of crunch all the numbers. You're looking at $285 million in Bellingham alone. And that's a very, very conservative figure to solve six of the, of the 13 problems. Um, $285 million. That's not for the rest of Whatcom County. It's not for Snohomish, Skagit, Pierce, or anywhere else. Uh, so that's, that's a lot of money. Uh, and I think uh, when we think about the sort of economic costs of fixing those problems, not to mention the economic costs of traffic delay, uh, it calls into question 
the economic merits uh, of these proposals. In, a in addition to traffic congestion, uh, there are very serious impacts for the state rail system. This is uh, a map produced by uh, Cambridge Systematics for the State Transportation Council uh, a few years back. Uh, and, you know, those are the class one, those are the major rail lines, class one rail lines in Washington state. Uh, green is pretty good, they move quickly. Yellow is uh, getting problematic and red uh, is congested or over capacity. Uh, it's no surprise to anybody in this room that we have problems um, of particular importance in Northwest Washington where we have for the most part a single uh, track also in Southwest Washington near Vancouver and the Stevens line. Uh, and if you zoom in uh, on Northwest Washington in particular, uh, and Shannon, I'm sure we'll talk much more about this, you can find um, a number of places where even if you took every other train off the tracks, every passenger rail service, every other type of freight commodity, every other train off the tracks, and just replaced it with the coal trains, you'd swamp the system. If you, re if you add the oil trains on top of that, then you've got an extra problem. Um, and in fact, that's what we're planning to do. And the oil trains are moving um, with uh, great speed and alacrity um, through this region already. Uh, since 2012, we have seen uh, in Washington and with one in Oregon, uh, a dozen oil by rail uh, terminals either built uh, uh, or pl planned, uh, 11 of them now uh, are still alive, one went away, uh, serving all five of the refineries on Puget Sound, including the, um, the four big ones in the North Sound, uh, three on Grays Harbor and a cluster on the Columbia River uh, down there, including one that's very, very large uh, in Vancouver, Washington. Um, this is all sort of new and additional to our thinking about coal train implications and implications for traffic uh, uh, on the rail system related to coal trains. Uh, these oil trains have not really been planned for, and that's partly because uh, the industry has developed so quickly uh, that very, very few people um, are either A, aware of it now, or B, had planned for it. And there's a whole other lecture I would give you about the fascinating developments in oil extraction um, if I had the caster-like ability to hold you here for six hours uh, and just lecture, but I won't do that today. Um, but it is really fascinating from an energy perspective. Um, suffice it to say, um, there's a lot of oil planned for, tr for train delivery to Washington State. On the left-hand side, that little multicolored column, uh, that's me stacking up, that's adding all of these proposals, right? These are, these are actually in permitting on some level. These are, like, these are not napkin sketches, these are real proposals. Add them all up, you're in the 860,000 barrels per day kind of range. The middle column is how much the entire region can refine. So, if you took away every drop that comes by pipeline, every drop that comes by tanker vessel, and replaced it only with oil trains planned for Washington State, you couldn't even come close to refining that much oil here. Which I think suggests that it doesn't take a, take a leap of the imagination to wonder whether or not this oil is really intended for us, uh, or whether it's intended for somebody else. On the right is the Keystone XL pipeline. That's how much oil would move in the Keystone XL. Uh, we have more planned for delivery to Washington than we do have planned uh, for the Keystone XL. That's just in oil trains. Uh, so it's a lot. Uh, as a way to sort of illustrate what it looks like when we have a rail system that starts to break down and not function for its traditional users, I think it's worthwhile drawing attention to some of the recent articles that have begun appearing uh, in media. This one was on the front page of the Seattle Times about three weeks ago, uh, and this uh, is a look at what's happened to uh, agricultural commodity shippers. This Cargill executive says, the sheer gravity, magnitude, and scope of rail service disruption now being experienced are unprecedented and have uh, rippled through all sectors of grain-based agriculture. Uh, this is a guy named Terry Whiteside who speaks for the Wheat and Barley Commissions uh, of most Western states. He's extremely knowledgeable about rail service and he does a lot of their interactions uh, with the Surface Transportation Board and with federal agencies who govern rail service. And he would say the huge increase in Bakken in oil movements and doubling of coal movements have contributed to the worst service meltdown in two decades affecting all commodity movements in the northern tier. This was in the New York Times just yesterday uh, and this is a farmer in North Dakota, if we can't get this stuff out soon, a lot of it is simply going to go on the ground and rot. They have a big, big problem. The New York Times um, did a very fantastic article on this yesterday. Uh, and to me, this sort of thing tees up um, precisely uh, the tension that we have, where an industry like farming, which we've been doing for hundreds of years in the Pacific Northwest, uh, now at conflict, and we can do for hundreds more, theoretically, uh, and maybe longer than that, uh, now in conflict with an industry that is very, very different from it, uh, and that is actually, on some level, pushing it right off the rails. Um, that, to me, is a pretty good crystallization of um, what a sustainable economy looks like as opposed to an unsustainable economy. 
Um, there was also reported recently, many, some of you know, uh, Cold Train Express, which was a, a Washington um, fruit packer and shipper. They shipped refrigerated service out of Quincy, Washington, employed about 100 people. They went clean out of business as of a couple of weeks ago, uh, in large part because of service reductions from BNSF. They, when they went out of business, they sent out a press release that put it entirely on rail service problems from BNSF. That's Washington jobs, Washington industry that can't move product east now because of Bakken oil uh, and to a lesser extent to coal. Uh, unfortunately, uh, rail system delays are the least of our worries when we think about oil trains. Uh, this is a picture of a little town in uh, Quebec from last July. Uh, that is what the town looked like after an oil train slipped its brakes, rolled into town and derailed. 47 people were incinerated uh, while they sat at bars uh, in, the, in the, the downtown uh, in that little town. Um, that's the Bakken oil. That's the same kind of oil that's rolling through Bellingham now. Those are the same kind of tank cars that are rolling through Bellingham right now. This stuff is very dangerous, uh, and it is not to be trifled with. And it's why earlier when I joked about you want the trains to move fast, uh, I sw wanted to walk that back. You don't actually want these trains to move very fast. You want them to move slow and carefully, uh, which m or not at all, uh, which is my own personal view on the matter. Uh, uh, so uh, this is what happened last summer in Quebec. Um, this is what happened last December. Uh, in North Dakota, right outside Fargo. Uh, this is actually on YouTube, and if you want to go to YouTube and uh, uh, North Dakota oil train explosion, you'll see a 300-foot-tall fireball uh, video that is just staggering. This is New Brunswick um, from January. Uh, that was actually from November uh, in uh, Alabama. And then this one's from April. Uh, this one, that's in Lynchburg, Virginia, in downtown Lynchburg. Uh, and I should point out that those happened with the new safe tank cars that the industry is resisting moving to. Okay, that's the solution. And thank goodness, uh, thank goodness that that train fell into the James River and spilled 400,000 gallons of, of fuel into the James River. If it had fallen the other way into town, uh, the death toll would have been probably enormous. Um, so the good news was that the James River got screwed up. Uh, the reason we're seeing this kind of, uh, uh, of development now is not because um, we haven't handled oil on trains before in this country. We have since the days of Standard Oil moved some amount of oil on trains. The reason has to do with this particular type of fuel, with these particular type of tank cars, with the industry in general, but also a catastrophic, this, this slide is way out of date actually. Um, the growth is actually much higher than that. Um, and the growth plan for the future is probably about double that. So on, on the left hand side for folks in the back, that's the average amount of oil that moved on trains prior to 2009. Like let's say 2005 to 2009 I think is where I did that calculation. On the right, that's what happened last year basically. And like I said, that's going to basically double as the industry scales up. Um, so we're looking at a lot more oil moving through a lot more communities, uh, not just in the Pacific Northwest, but nationally. Uh, and I should mention, so one of the things I've done over the last um, little bit as we've all gotten more and more concerned about this is I've mapped every freight train derailment in the, in the Northwest region uh, that's happened over the last two and a half years. Over the last two and a half years, we have about nine freight derailments a month uh, in the Northwest region. Most of those are low stakes, and they happen at slow speeds in rail yards because they're switching. Not a big deal. Uh, occasionally, they're a very big deal, and something uh, awful goes wrong. If something goes wrong with an oil train, especially at speed, uh, we could have a very serious problem. Uh, and it is of um, some personal interest that I note that an oil train actually did derail in Seattle uh, earlier, uh, or I guess it was last month now, uh, at five miles an hour, uh, two oil cars tipped over and fell on their sides. Uh, under the Magnolia Bridge, um, which could have been catastrophic. Thank God nothing happened. Um, but it would have been ugly if something like that happens uh, in an urban area. Uh, and I like to draw attention to this, which I think is an often overlooked feature uh, of rail movements in general, but particularly of hazardous substances um, like a combustible type of crude oil. This is a fellow quoted in the Wall Street Journal who is probably the um, uh, nation's leading expert on uh, rail industry um, insurance. And he says there's, no, there's currently uh, not enough uh, coverage in the com commercial insurance market anywhere in the world to cover the worst case derailment scenario. Uh, so if you can imagine an oil train derailing catastrophically in a town like Lynchburg or Bellingham, Seattle, you name it, uh, where you have a death toll uh, and property damage, uh, the in insurance isn't covering that. The rail's not covering that. That's on the cost of cleanup, the loss of life, the loss of property on some level will be on taxpayers. That will all almost entirely be on taxpayers. And of course, we're not going to let a class one railroad go out of business. So on some level, we'll have to pick up the pieces of whatever's left of that company and put it back together. Um, that railroad in Quebec, by the way, that derailed, that thing was out of business, bankrupt within weeks. Um, 
because of the liability claims, uh, of course. So um, this is a real serious um, economic question. We do not appropriately manage or price risk when we think about oil trains. And I think that it should be a completely nonpartisan, non-political concern to have the industry manage and price risk and insure themselves for the risks that, that we are now assuming for them. I have not now, uh, in the course of this talk, done anything on the environment, but I do have to close with one slide, or two, actually two slides, um, because I think this is important. And I want to take us back up as I wrap up um, to the higher level and kind of frame up the regional dimensions of this stuff. Uh, for those in the back, um, uh, what you'll see on the left is the left column is the Keystone XL pipeline. And I use that just because it's sort of a bellwether of environmental politics these days. It's considered Obama's litmus test on the environment. That's the amount of carbon that would move through the Keystone XL pipeline uh, on an annual basis. It's about 150 million tons-ish uh, of, of CO2. Uh, on the right, uh, that is what is uh, not existing, but new, planned projects for Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, a lot of them really close to Bellingham, uh, and I stacked up coal, oil, natural gas, uh, oil by pipeline and oil by train, and when you stack those all up, it's about five or five and a half times as much as the Keystone XL pipeline, all planned for this region, uh, in addition to what uh, already happens here. So we are, and I, th I think this really tees up, the very peculiar historical spot that this region is in. Uh, although there is obviously a fossil fuel economy here to the extent that there are oil refineries and some other um, projects, this is not an area that has typically thought about itself as a sort of Gulf Coast on the Pacific. Um, but these energy firms really do have designs to put all this stuff through. All of this stuff is being actively debated. It's all in permits right now, uh, or, it's being, or it's, the permits are being debated. Uh, and the question, really, uh, that I think this region is facing, not just Bellingham, but the Pacific Northwest in general is facing, is whether we are going to grant them permission slips and whether we're going to become uh, a carbon uh, and fossil fuel export hub of global consequence, uh, a sort of Gulf Coast on the Pacific, or whether we're going to chart a different course uh, and whether that little crescent of land is going to act as a thin green line, uh, a sort of sandbar that prevents those fossil fuel deposits from reaching markets in Asia. And that's where I'll stop. Thanks. Thank you, Eric, I think. Uh, now uh, we're going to go on to our second speaker, Shannon Wright. Shannon is the executive director of Community Wise Bellingham. She has a BA and MA from Brown University in development studies. Community Wise Bellingham was founded in 2011 in local Bellingham by local Bellingham residents. The organization's goal is to mitigate or eliminate negative impacts of the proposed GPT export terminal on our quality of life, local economy, environmental, and waterfront access. The organization focuses on researching and disseminating factual information about the Gateway Pacific Terminal identifying potential impacts on our community, and especially important, watchdogging the public process. Please welcome Shannon. Good afternoon, thank you for having me. I'm Shannon Wright, the Executive Director of Community Wise Bellingham, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, as mentioned before, I'm gonna try to take this discussion and take a look at what it would mean for us locally, some of the impacts that we have here um, in the Bellingham and Whatcom County area. This is the view from Cherry Point where the proposed Gateway Pacific Terminal project would be built. Uh, I wanted to first, for any of you who are not familiar with Community Wise Bellingham, give you an idea of, of our organization. We were formed here in Bellingham in 2011 by locals. Our focus is on informing the conversation ar around the Gateway Pacific Terminal Project through research and commissioning independent reports. Our board has not taken a position for or against the project per se. What we do agree on and, pr and push forward in our community is that more information really does equal better decision making. That we believe that robust civic participation and community engagement is gonna lead to the best possible outcome and decision making for all of us. 
Um, I'm going to focus my comments today on three major areas of impacts, um, and I'm not going to talk mostly about the environment either, um, but we'll make some reference. One is the local economic impact and risks. A second one ha area is the need for new rail infrastructure to accommodate the additional oil and coal trains. And the third one is the potential cost to taxpayers locally, um, which Eric has also touched on. Coal and oil trains, economic impact. Um, I want to start much of my comments, both because it's our organizational focus uh, of, is on Gateway Pacific Terminal Project, um, and also because of GPT's sheer volume um, really dwarfs that of any other oil or coal project in the area. Much of my comments and the information here is going to be focused on GPT. For those of you in the back, um, if you can see this, we have three bar graphs here. On the left is GPT's train volumes, 18 trains a day, half empty, 16 of those for coal. In comparison, you can see our current train volume, um, both the lower part with the red is for coal and then for other, other freight. And then on the far right-hand side, the future coal and oil train volumes. Um, some of them proposed, some of them have recently been, uh, have been approved, such as the Fraser Shuri docks to the north of us. And what you can see is that GBT is on a whole different scale. Um, the GBT alone more than, is more than both the current and the planned coal and oil train traffic. Um, and this includes West Shore in British Columbia and BP oil trains we're currently seeing, as well as proposed project, projects with Phillips 66 oil trains, new West Shore capacity, and uh, the new docks just north of here. So in terms of given impact, really this project is beyond the others. Of course, GBT comes with economic benefits that the project proponents have let us know about and are important to take as, as a piece of any conversation um, that we would have on-site jobs uh, at full build-out, about 213, total to direct, direct jobs, 430, an important contribution in state uh, and personal state uh, tax contributions and personal income. And if you want more details, of course, the GBT website has quite a bit of information on these numbers. So that's one side of the equation. The question for us locally is really what is the net economic benefit, right? Any, any proposal, any business, we have to look both the costs and the benefits. What are the risks to us as well? Um, the developers, of course, showcase the benefits, but what else might this large increase in train traffic, port operations, and tanker traffic mean for our communities? And what piece of these costs and risks are going to be externalized to the public? Um, and Eric spoke to some of that as well. Well, it was with this in mind that in 2011 we commissioned public financial management to assess some of the local economic impacts. And their report findings were that GPT could actually have a net negative impact on, on employment here in Whatcom County, specifically by jeopardizing other business sectors, that the volume of train traffic, the congestion, the noise, the, um, the, the the impact on access and connectivity in our neighborhoods, the stigma, potential impact on tourism, could all have a negative impact. And um, we have commissioned PFM to do a follow-up study, which is underway now, and will be released uh, this fall. This diagram gets at some of the points that the PFM is studying, I think, that many of us in the community have asked. Put the GPT jobs in perspective with other jobs. Um, the Port of Bellingham estimates that over the course of 20 years, some 5,600 jobs could be created through waterfront redevelopment. This Whatcom County uh, added over 4,300 jobs between 2011 and 2000, 2011, 2012 during a time of uh, recovery, really, from the recession. So just a natural growth of our fairly diverse uh, economic base. The, the, our, our community, our neighbor, our uh, county added this many jobs. In comparison, the 430 direct jobs created by GPT in the proposal and 213 on site. So what this, I think the question that this really brings up for us is that if GPT's impacts from the train traffic in particular even had a minimal impact on the success of waterfront redevelopment, for, for instance, uh, even a minimal impact could really offset the other job gains that would be made by the construction of the terminal. So these are the questions that we need to really take into account when we look at what it could mean economically for us in our community. And in fact, the city of Bellingham has called for greater economic analysis as well. In letters both to the county and the EIS agencies, the city, the city council and the mayor have asked for greater analysis to really understand what this might mean. 
um, in, to, in terms of everything from job creation to tourism impacts and question of the property values and property taxes. Which brings us to, uh, to our next area, which is new rail infrastructure. And I will address some of the revelations that we have seen in the Bellingham Herald recently from BNSF about some new developments, um, both in the siding in Ferndale and routing some of the trains through Sumas. What we do know is that Whatcom County's railroads cannot simply handle GPT's additional 18 trains a day as things are, that you must have changes, that we are, live along a, si a, a single track bottleneck. Washington State Department of Transportation has, uh, has identified over and over again this bottleneck and independent expert studies have also indicated that no, new tracks would be needed to, uh, to a, if you were to add 18 trains a day. Um, and our single track here in Bellingham, um, as you may know, we, uh, between Bow and Ferndale, it is a single track. Only one train can be on this area at a time. There is a short siding down uh, at the Amtrak station where an Amtrak train can pull over, but freight trains you can only have one freight train on this track at a time. Our capacity is about 14 to 15 trains a day. However, with the slower coal trains, and as Eric mentioned, with the oil trains, you certainly want them going slowly, that daily capacity is lower, more in the 12 to 13 range, which is about where we are right now. We're probably a little below that, but we are hovering near that, that level. The preferred solution to this train bottleneck, if you were to add a GPT level of impact would be to construct a new active siding along the Bellingham waterfront. What does the siding do? Well, it increases our capacity. It serves as a short parallel track. Um, and in the case of the coal trains, it, it, the coal train pulls over, remains idling, all five engines remain idling while another train passes. Um, wherever, the, the, wherever you have a construction of a new siding, both the trails and the roads crossing the siding will be permanently blocked. Uh, you would have to create bridges and overpasses to reconnect those two sides together. Other impacts that you can see from new rail sidings are increased health risks from uh, diesel particulate matter with all the, the exhaust from idling trains, delayed emergency response, increased traffic uh, congestion, and others. This is a, probably a familiar sight for many in Boulevard Park, a coal train headed north. This is where the South Bay Trail comes and, uh, and crosses. This is the same site, an artist's uh, rendition of what this area would look like with the, uh, the waterfront siding. And as you can see, the South Bay Trail is now blocked off with, uh, with gates on both sides. Um, you cannot have crossing in these areas because the northbound loaded train um, would be, would be uh, stationary and idling while a southbound train in this case is passing by. This map helps indicate uh, where this proposed siting would be, this, this identified location that Washington, Washington State Department of Transportation says would be, give the greatest uh, capacity increase. It is the black line with the two orange ends um, that spans from the Taylor Dock through the full length of Boulevard Park and ends in the former GP area. Which brings us, of course, to the question of the cost of taxpayers. Well, who would pay for to reconnect, uh, our, our, our reconnect our access to the waterfront within our communities? And um, we would need new infrastructure, and with that we would need overpasses and upgraded rail crossings if GPT were built. As Eric said, uh, under, these, under the law, under the terms of, of how BNSF operates, the taxpayers, we local taxpayers, would be on the hook for 95% of these mitigation costs. So while the railroad would actually build the siding, we as a community are responsible for any sort of reconnection um, and grade crossings, overpasses, and bridges. Fortunately, uh, Whatcom County Co Code does offer us some protections if fully applied. The code requires that major project expenses, such as mitigations for these rail sightings, are not passed on to the taxpayers. Uh, the code is very specific about that, and a developer will not impose uncompensated requirements for public expenditures for additional utilities, facilities, and services. And this is an important point, because these rail sightings are, would be, uh, they're, 
necessary if you were going to add 18 trains a day. You cannot add 18 trains a day without adding new infrastructure. And yet, at this currently, it is not in part of the project application. GPT is not, has not disclosed how they, plan, how they plan to route the trains. SSA Marine did not include this siting in their project application. This is an important point. This information needs to be disclosed and added to the application. Local taxpayers should not need to absorb these costs for necessary infrastructure for GPT to operate. So I wanted to address some of the new information if you followed the articles uh, this last week in the Bellingham Herald. We've learned two new pieces of information. One is that the Highway 9 Sumas route will be used for um, oil trains and empty coal trains. Um, and this concurs with, uh, with, with community-wise Bellingham's analysis and presentation of the city earlier in the year of our understanding of how uh, BNSF would be routing. The second piece is that BNSF will also construct two four-mile tracks, north and south of Ferndale, uh, long enough to store two long freight trains. Now, it appears that, that, these two, that these two tracks would be primarily to address the congestion at the Custer area. It would not eliminate the need for additional capacity between Bow and, uh, and, and north of Bellingham. It does not take the Bellingham siding along our waterfront out of play. And this is an important point. So with this new information, it also brings up for us the potential new impact areas and concerns. Uh, in the case of, for the, for the towns and the inland uh, cities of the South Fork, I mean, they have already been experiencing and have been noting for the last couple, uh, for the last, the last year or so, new trains going through this area. Um, and what you can expect to see there, the, some of the concerns that will need to be understood and studied include that empty coal trains and possibly oil trains in the future would lead to increased noise, traffic congestions, emergency response times, there's concern about commerce and agriculture. In the case of Ferndale, uh, you can also imagine with these two new sightings, and this has been discussed some in the, uh, in the Bellingham Herald, blocked road access in some areas, increased diesel exhausts, um, including some of these areas, the, the siding would go right along the, the Ferndale High School. Slater Road is a big question. This is really critical. This is obviously we need some sort of grade separation with the traffic to ensure that we don't have transportation blocks and commerce. And um, budget, there is nothing in the county budget currently to address the, the question of Slater Road being blocked. And Bellingham. Um, as I just said, the waterfront siding is still very much in, pl in play. BNSF said they do not have any current plans to build it. If you read the article carefully in the Bellingham Herald, they also noted that they only approve plans a year in advance, and this has been a discussion for many years for them. So there is the, by adding a South Ferndale siding, it does not relieve the congestion that GPT on top of our, the oil trains and uh, additional coal trains would create through our, um, through our stretch of rail. Uh, and a final point on this, one, one question for all of Whatcom County is it could be as well that in the case of, uh, what, by adding these, the, the sidings in Ferndale, it could actually put pressure for the state to reconsider some of the previously discarded options, like instead of putting the siding along the Bellingham waterfront, that it could get pushed down to Chuckanut Drive or the Larrabee Park area or, or Samish Bay. So it does put some new questions into play. Um, it does not resolve the, the problem of, of the bottleneck, but it does bring into question what will be the final plans. And I wanted to close by just, um, you know, a bit like Eric, take, stepping back a bit and realizing that this, that we really have to consider these different projects as an aggregate effect. These projects, uh, whether they're oil or coal, do not operate in isolation, that they compound and they interact. This, um, everything from the concerns about oil trains explosion risks, and this is a map courtesy of Google Maps and Forest Ethics of the blast and evacuation zones in downtown Bellingham, to concerns about GPT sheer volume and tra transportation impacts on top of the current coal traffic for BC exports. And what it really brings to, to light is that the coal and oil trains have a cumulative impact on our communities. 
um, that one thing on top of, a, of another. The GPT is by far the largest and is exacerbated by the additional coal and oil traffic. There's mounting impacts from these projects, from health impacts to potential threat and quality of life, decreased property, property values and risks for, uh, for businesses. And that we really need full information from the project applicants and, uh, about what are the impacts of the, of the projects, what, um, where are the actual train routings, and, uh, and how, what is the new infrastructure that will be necessary to deal with these routings. This cannot be uh, brought out piece by piece. We need full disclosure to understand. This is important for our cities and our communities to be able to plan waterfront redevelopments taking place here in Bellingham right now. City planners need to have an understanding of what this might mean. And our county and state need to tackle these issues uh, fully. We need to understand how coal trains and oil trains interact on our rails and our communities. And in the meantime, our cities, the port, our ports, our port and, uh, and local organizations can play an increasingly strong role in asking these important questions and having these issues studied. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. And now is our usual practice. The uh, City Club Program Committee came up with a couple of questions, and then we'll open it to the audience. The increase in shipping back in oil to our refinery seemed to catch us all by surprise. How did we get to the point that this is a fait accompli without a lot of public scrutiny? Do you want to start? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, again, I need like three hours. but. Uh, uh, I'll do it in two minutes. Um, well, so, so what happened with the Bakken uh, region was a little bit unexpected even in the industry. Um, basically new fracking and drilling techniques um, uh, made it economical to extract large volumes of oil from a place that, I mean, oil had been known to be there for a long, long time, but we couldn't get it out economically. So now we're basically taking it from a mile or two miles deep in the shale formations. It's coming out into a region that's not well served by pipelines. Um, and so there's not what they call takeaway infrastructure in that region. Uh, BNSF uh, and some other railroads, but principally BNSF, stepped into the breach uh, in a hurry and started loading that oil onto any tank cars they had available and moving it. At the same time, uh, on the coast, uh, oil refineries um, quickly built uh, rail unloading infrastructure, uh, including BP up at Ferndale. ConocoPhillips is almost done with construction, or Phillips 66, I guess it is now, uh, and then also uh, in Anacortes. Um, and that all happened um, really just through some minor county, county land use permitting. Um, and so that ship sailed, so to speak, um, really before most of us realized, and even folks in the industry realized just how big this stuff was. Uh, I did my first uh, sort of inventory of these projects in the Pacific Northwest, um, you know, way too late. But even after I completed it, I was still getting calls from the energy report at the Wall Street Journal saying, how did you figure this stuff out? And basically, I had just sort of looked at county land use permits uh, all around uh, uh, the region. The, the oil refineries is a big issue, especially for this region that's affected by rail traffic to them. Um, in addition to that, there are new port terminals uh, for Grays Harbor uh, and for the Columbia River. Uh, and that stuff basically will come in on train, get transferred into storage tanks, and then onto barges or ocean going vessels, uh, and just move out into the Pacific uh, or down to California. And those things are enormous. Uh, you know, we're talking 360,000 barrels per day. Um, which is like BP and Phillips 66 combined total capacity. Um, that's just for one site at Vancouver, Washington. Um, so this stuff has moved extremely quickly, um, and it really has caught a lot of us by surprise, uh, including, um, I think I, I can call myself a professional uh, analyst of the industry. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, Warren Buffett didn't miss it. Uh, he got it. Um, <laughs> maybe that's why he has more money than I do. So given the reports that regulatory failures were the main cause of the fiery crash in Quebec, resulting in the loss of 47 lives, what is your opinion on what regulations are called for? Who would do the enforcing, and how can the public ensure that the regulations are followed? So my, my, my view on this is, uh, is almost exactly in line with what the um, Washington State Firefighters Union uh, just said uh, at their at their annual meeting, uh, and they said, "Look, we need a we need a moratorium on moving crude oil by rail until we can do it safely, until we can manage the risks." Uh, and 
and to me, that's, that's a, I, I think that should be a non-controversial position. These things are very, very dangerous. Uh, the, the, the risk of catastrophic explosion is small, but if it happens, it's a big, big deal, and we're moving a lot of these tank cars. Um, so that's, that's my initial point of view. Uh, after that, I, then I think we need to figure out, um, is the fuel that we're putting in these tank cars safe? Uh, are the volatile gases stripped out of it? Uh, in the case of the North Dakota fuel, they're not. They're packed in there with what's you know, a more conventional form of crude oil. Uh, you know, are the tank cars adequate to withstand uh, impacts and address uh, fuel leakage uh, as well as explosions? Uh, the old tank cars are clearly not, despite what the industry says. I mean, you'd have to look at the pictures. They blow up. The new tank cars may also not be adequate to that task. Uh, and then, third, we need to figure out whether or not it makes sense from an energy policy perspective to build up all this infrastructure to move uh, you know, oil from Canada or from North Dakota, because the play after this, Bach, the Bakken formation won't play out. I mean, that's probably a 10 to 15 year extraction period, and then it, that's mostly gonna be done is sort of the consensus view in the industry. After that, it's probably large volumes of heavier Canadian crudes um, moving to ports. And there's a whole sort of set of questions around that. But right now, I think the first thing to do is a moratorium until we can structure the regulations appropriately. That's the last thing that we're doing right now, by the way. Sorry. This one's for you, Shannon. There are several fossil fuel proposals in various stages of review in Canada. How does this affect our rail traffic? You've said that Gateway is the biggest driver of traffic, but will we get the big rail increases regardless of what projects are permitted in the state? Is this a Canada versus the U.S. situation? Uh, we already do, as we all know, have two to three train, uh, coal trains coming through Bellingham currently going to West Shore um, terminals in the Vancouver area. And Canada does have two additional coal export facilities. One is in uh, North and Prince Rupert, the Ridley terminals. And um, it is just, it, 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 there have been coal trains that have gone our route to Ridley and it is just not economically uh, feasible for they cannot make any money. Um, it's just, it's the largest haul, um, a, a train haul or coal haul uh, in North America. So it doesn't make any sense. They take an inland route um, for Potter River Basin U.S. coal to be exported from really. The other coal export facility is um, is Neptune, which is actually a crown, you know, is, is owned by the Canadian government and um, is really meant for Canadian coal producers because Canada as well is going through a coal boom and there are Alberta and British Columbia coal mines and they, those companies also are looking to get their, uh, their commodity to port. So, um, and then the, the fourth spot is the Fraser Surrey docks, which has just been approved for 4 million metric tons of coal a year um, or approximately 1.6 trains, half of them full, half of them empty through our community. So there is coal coming through. There is um, good reason to believe, and some have been permitted for additional coal to, be, to come through, uh, through Western Washington on route to BC. Um, the magnitude, even if when we, in, in analyzing this, we have tended to try to use the upper numbers, right? We do not want to be accused of trying to minimize in any way what's, what the potential is. But even if you take the highest possible numbers, the volume um, is, is really dwarfed by that with the Gateway Pacific Terminal. So it's not to say that three coal trains a day are nothing, um, they don't have impacts, because we all know they do have impacts, especially if you're close to the rails, and especially when we begin to th imagine the interaction with increased oil train traffic, but it is on a different magnitude. Okay. And one more. Is it true that taxpayers have already funded $1.3 million in rail upgrades in our state using TARP funds designated to improve high-speed passenger rail, like the work that's being done below Chuckanut right now? And the second part of that question is, is there any precedent for shifting cost of any of this infrastructure that might need to be built to the railroads and the producers of the product, the people who actually benefit. Do you want to try that one? <laughs> I, I can uh, answer it partially, and maybe Eric, you have more specifics. Like answer too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there there are upgrades that have been taking place, and, and a portion of it, and I cannot tell you exactly how much does uh, is um, you know taxpayer funded. Um, I mean, there is no question that along our main line that goes through uh, through Bellingham um, that that. Uh, upgrades over over years that really the business model has been taxpayers underwriting a huge portion of the maintenance for the BNSF line um, and many people would would believe that that is actually um, really like a subsidy subsidy to BNSF that over time that um, huge 
taxpayer funds are put, so, you know, with, a, with an eye towards Amtrak and increasing uh, the, the velocity and the efficiency, but really that it benefits um, disproportionately the freight business of BNSF. Um, in terms of the second question was shifting it over, being is, able to is there shift. Is precedent for shifting? We talk about the 5% cost that BNS would pay, BNSF would pay for any infrastructure costs. Is there anywhere that it, they've paid more or that that might happen? So the 5%, um, just to be clear, uh, there, there are costs that, for instance, that the railroad itself pays for in upgrading its line. The, five, the cost that we're, that we're referring to with the 5% is mitigation. So it means to, like, in the case, uh, in the case of Bellingham, we have a huge increase in traffic volume, and uh, we cut off some of our access points, and we need to build new bridges. That's the mitigation. Um, and that is the piece that falls lar largely to us. And there is not a precedent. In fact, um, our understanding is that in practice, usually it's much less than 5% that, that the railroad helps out with. I know BNSF was quoted this last week in saying that they sometimes partner with local and state governments to try to find funding. Um, <laughs> um, but in practice, how it usually plays out is that it's the taxpayers you know, pay 95 or plus percent to reconnect those areas and for safety upgrades and everything else. So, and you know, in the case, for instance, uh, in the case of Cedar Woolley, this new information that's come out, I mean, it, it, we've all driven through Cedar Woolley. I mean, it's crisscrossing with, with, with the railroads. And, and you can imagine with an increased traffic what it's going to be like for that community. There's a lot of uh, tight turns. You have to go slow. So, you know, they're beginning to wonder how, what can they do? And then it really would fall upon them, not the railroad, to pay for or any sort of at-grade crossings or overpasses. Um, so there is not a precedent that I'm aware of where the, um, I mean, it's actually legally, they're not, they're, they're not allowed to pay more than 5%. Let me just tag on real quick. Uh, the beginning of the question uh, was about high-speed rail funds. Um, I don't think it was TARP money, I think it was R money, but there is pretty good evidence that R money dedicated for high-speed passenger rail service, particularly in the East, was used to fund freight infrastructure upgrades. Uh, there's a guy named Curtis Tate, who's a McClatchy reporter out of DC, who's done some really good work on this. And whoever had that question, if you email me, um, I've taken a look at the way that state taxpayers, through the Freight Mobility Board and others agencies uh, in this, in WashDOT, um, fund freight rail uh, infrastructure upgrades, as well as um, sort of passenger rail upgrades that, of course, because it's the same system, um, have co-benefits for freight rail. Uh, not to say we shouldn't be spending money on, you know, upgrading our infrastructure, right? I think that's a completely reasonable public policy discussion to have. Um, it's just that uh, we need to be clear about what we're spending and what we're getting for it. Uh, and in some cases, I think the value proposition doesn't pencil. Um, so that's, that's kind of the approach I have. Um, to this, that it's, it is actually a fairly complicated uh, issue in some ways, but the high-speed rail are a, the stimulus money um, question. I think is is super concerning. Um. Now it's your turn. Our usual policy for questions is to um, let people who have a city club badge wearing members to ask questions first. We have two microphones in the room. Chuck is moving his way over that way, and Don has one right here. Please wait till you get to have a mic with you before you ask your question so we can all hear it. And remember, this is not a time for speeches, it's a time for questions. <laughs> so please keep them brief so we can get as many in as possible. So Chuck, it looks like you're ready. Right. Um, regarding the, the federal law that puts a limit of what the railroads can pay for uh, mitigation at f a maximum of 5%, since that's federal law, should we have any confidence at all that the county law requiring the railroad to pay, can't pass on costs. Doesn't federal law always trump local and state law? So th that, that is an interesting point. Um, but the, the important point is the project applicant in the case of Gateway Pacific Terminal. terminal. The project applicant is SSA Marine. Um, and, it, and SSA Marine has not included these sightings in its pro project application, um, and we can, you know, wonder why. But um, the, they are the ones who are on the hook to make sure that these unmitigated uh, impacts are not passed on to the taxpayers. It is not BNSF per se, it is SSA Marine. And this is a very important point. Um, and uh, this is why both this, the, and the city of Bellingham has written letters as, as recently as last month to the county asking for additional information and for them to require SSA Marine to disclose how they plan to get these 18 trains a day, their commodity to market. 
um, because as it stands right now, you can't do it. So if you can't do it, and, and you might recall if you, um, part of the project application includes a, pro a, a, a rail spur, the Custer spur. So they've acknowledged, yes, we're gonna need somewhere to put these trains near Custer. What they have not acknowledged is that they need to add some active siding somewhere else in, Bell in Whatcom County, most likely along the Bellingham waterfront. Um, so they're on the hook in this case. Don? Has there been any, any consideration given to the Amtrak trains? I'm really proud of our Amtrak service that goes between Seattle and Vancouver twice a day for a total of four trains. And if we increase the number of freight trains <laughs> that go through this single track area, what do you think the long-term viability of the Amtrak service is in this area? Can I, let me start off with a very partial answer because I, last week in Everett I did a um, panel discussion or a debate or something uh, with where BNSF actually did show up and they said that um, uh, the passenger service uh, uh, is not bumped by freight rail. So that's what they said. And I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave Shannon to answer the rest of the question. Uh, <laughs> I'd also ride passenger rail, so I have a different view of the matter. But <laughs> uh, well, I think that's a, a big concern of, uh, of, of, for many of us. And in fact, um, you know, last a year ago, uh, January, when the the period when the public an open public comment period when um, you know. 25,000 people, uh, as I write, that, that's correct, 16,000 people, you know, unprecedented number of Washingtonians made comments to our state and county regulators about what we thought needed to be uh, studied in the environmental review process for GPT. Um, Amtrak was one of the bit, top questions that came up. People really are interested in this, and in fact, I think our community would really like to see additional um, Amtrak services, and one of the things um, that... <laughs> One of the things that's been studied by uh, the Council of Governments in, Washington, in Whatcom County is could you add a few more train trips a day or would you need more sightings? Would we need infrastructure? And the answer has been no. We can add a few more trains a day through Amtrak. We could have additional service and we don't need new infrastructure. It's when you start adding high volumes of, of freight and coal traffic that we end up with this, with this question. So this is an unanswered question. Um, I, uh, hopefully that the EIS will take a look at it, but I think that this is one of these places that it really serves our community and it's worth, um, it's worth some additional study because there is, it could certainly um, impact it. And we have good reason to believe we are actually in the process at Community Wise um, of reviewing some of the data on on-time service. And there is reason to believe that the increase in freight traffic, particularly coal, coal, uh, slow coal, coal trains are already impacting the on-time arrival for Amtrak. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you have any responses to the larger question of the impact of the extraction and burning of fossil fuels on climate change? Railroads are terribly important, but it all relates yes. to the extraction of fossil fuels. Mm. Uh, uh. I mean, the, the, carbon, the carbon implications of moving this much fuel are, are enormous. I mean, the, the, if you, I sort of like to do kind of thumbnail calculations for carbon content. And the annual shipments from Gateway Pacific, for example, the carbon in that coal when it's burned, are roughly equivalent to every activity in the state of Washington combined uh, on an annual basis. So every car, every factory, everything. So all the efforts that we make to reduce greenhouse ga gas emissions in the state um, while laudable, uh, would be on, in some sense. Of course, there are complicated economic factors at work, right? But just on a sort of like, you know, kind of thumbnail sketch scenario, one coal terminal is about equal to the entire state's greenhouse gas portfolio. So it's a big deal. Uh, and then you add in the oil pipelines and the gas pipelines and the oil terminals and everything else, and you got, you know, pretty soon you're talking about a really toasty planet that I don't particularly want to live in. I'm a great believer in following the wisdom of Deep Throat, uh, which is follow the money. There's a substantial uh, amount of in infrastructure which apparently will fall on the citizens of Whatcom County and of Bellingham to improve grade crossings. Has that figured in, number one, has that figured into the net benefits uh, and loss and uh, detriments of both coal trains and oil trains? Number two, what mechanisms are you aware of that the city and county can use to fund that? I can speak to the first part. Um, and, and, you know, the environmental impact 
uh, review that is taking place right now for Gateway Pacific Terminal, unfortunately does not include a net economic benefits piece, um, uh, which, you know, it, it, this EIS is unprecedented in its scope, um, and that has been a real, um, a real win for our community, that we're going to have more information, our decision makers will have more information than, than uh, would have previously happened. However, there is a, a gaping hole in economic analysis in this, economic, in this environmental impact study. It is with that in mind that um, we have commissioned studies and commissioning others, and that, uh, and that we really encourage cities and counties to, uh, to, to do additional study. Um, and so the answer is no, it's not being taken into account on an official level. Um, does that mean that, uh, that all of us need to take it into account? And it doesn't mean that when it comes time for our county council to assess whether or not GPT is a good idea for us, I, I certainly hope that they have in front of them information from studies and the pure costs outlay it would require. Um, when they take that into account. I mean, one of the quirks of GPT's um, revenue, however, is that, you know, uh, there, are, there are certain school districts, there are certain jurisdictions that would definitely have tax benefits. They, they would see an influx, and it would be very beneficial for them in that way. Um, the city of Bellingham would not receive direct benefits. So um, in terms of who is paying the, out, the costs and who is receiving the benefits, those two are not in sync. Um, and that's, I think, a, a real concern that needs to be addressed. Um, the question of uh, how to identify the, those uh, revenue sources. Um, I think that, it, particularly, you know, just looking at Eric's slides that showed the 13 crossings just in Bellingham, I mean, this is, one thing we have to also understand is that in the case of GPT, project proponents are now saying that they would have it up at, they're not going to do it in two phases if approved. They would, uh, that this, that the terminal would be built, be fully built out from day one, and that by 2019 they'd have it up and running. And really overnight we would see um, more than doubling, way more than doubling our current traffic. So, you know, we, the, the, the crossings and the, um, the, the safety checks that we have in our town currently have been developed over decades. We've paid for these slowly and surely. So overnight um, we would need to be able to, to upgrade. Um, and so is it possible to, to identify state and federal funding? Sure. But to, to identify for all of Western Washington, and remember this you know, this coal, the, the trains um, originate in Montana and uh, in Wyoming. We, you know, we're not the only communities that are experiencing this. So is there a pot of gold somewhere to address all of these? There is not. Um, and this is a piece of the puzzle that is not being considered. I, I think we have to look very carefully at how the city of Bellingham is approaching this question because it has such impact for all of us. That's easily measured by looking at how many full-time equivalent staff are directed currently to be working on this, whether it's public works, legal department, uh, planning. So my question is, has the, has the mayor prioritized these rail issues, one, and two, how much has the city council incorporated into the current budget in full-time equivalent staff directed to these questions? I do not have full answer to that, um, but what I do know is that um, you know this is this, this project is of a magnitude uh, beyond anything that you know this, the city has come upon before. I would, you're the former mayor, you could tell me, but um, my sense is this is something that is you know that is it's hard to tackle. I believe that both the city council and the mayor have been responsive in terms of putting pressure on the county and beginning to recognize the, the, the multi-layered effect this could have in our community. Is there more that can be done? Absolutely. Would it be really worthwhile if the, if the city could assign more staff time to this, to this question, particularly in this next year, because what we're going to be seeing happening is that as the environmental impact study is completed, probably sometime about a year from now or so, we as citizens, as cities, as organizations are going to be, need to be very engaged and give direct feedback to our county and state legislators um, about this. And that is going to be a time where the city is going, is going to need to resource and probably up their resource level, in my opinion. So I, I would, um, certainly at CommunityWise, we would welcome an increased staffing, um, but we do feel that there has been a, an important level of vigilance on the part of the city council and, and, uh, and support from the mayor. Yes. One more over here. 
Hi there. Uh, this has been really interesting uh, and informative uh, talks that you've given. And I've been, although we've, we've got separate issues here, and many of us have been looking at GPT, and you're talking to that a lot about locally, but I'm, what Eric was showing, that I go back to that first slide, where you show all the arrows, and I'm particularly interested in the um, oil trains and how that has gotten out ahead of everyone. And so my question is, you, you sort of ended it saying, we're in an interesting position here. Um, and you see us where we are, sort of in the catbird seat. But are we in the catbird seat? Or are we simply being run over by a uh, juggernaut, which we're all really helpless to stop? And so as an individual who attends these sort of meetings and goes out to Lummi and prays with the Native Americans with their healing totem pole, you just wonder, what can we really do? And I'd like um, either of you to uh, address that. I, let me take a crack at that, because um, this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. I, I remember, um, it was not that many years ago when these coal export proposals first landed, uh, and um, I'll be honest with you, I was pretty bearish at first. I thought, you know what, there's not a lot we can do um, to arrest the progress of these. And I, in fact, I remember sitting down with um, some of the project proponents and some others uh, in an office building in downtown Seattle, and I'm paraphrasing, so, you know, understand that this is not a direct quote, but they said something on the order of, come on, we're gonna steamroll you, it's over, just get out of the way, how can we make this easy for you? I know it's embarrassing, but we're gonna build a huge coal terminal, so deal with it. That's kind of the tenor of the conversation, and it was sort of delivered about like that. Um, to which um, my colleagues in advocacy and, and myself sort of looked at them and said, well, we don't think it's gonna be quite that easy, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, and it was just a few months ago, um, that uh, a reporter in Billings, uh, who was reporting on a coal industry conference there, um, quoted them directly and said, we're being outgunned in the Pacific Northwest, and unless we get help from the state governments of Wyoming and Montana, the big coal states, we can't get our projects through. We think we're gonna lose. Um, and that, yeah, that's happened in, in the space of about two years. Um, and it's happened because of folks in this room and, and folks in other rooms like this one. Uh, and I, you know, I don't wanna, um, I'm not gonna put it, putting the W up on the chalkboard yet, but um, I think we're gonna win on, and when I say win, I mean stop, uh, the coal export proposals in the Pacific Northwest, at least in Oregon and Washington, and I think we will win over the longer term in Canada as well. Uh, the oil terminals are different, they're different beasts, they're different economic actors, um, but many of the same dynamics in play, and I am extremely optimistic for a whole bunch of reasons um, that these can be rejected. The fundamental reason why I'm optimistic is because on some level, and I, this does sound simplistic, but it's right, they need our permission. They need actual permits in their hands, land use permits, air quality permits, and everything else um, from a region that is not particularly well suited to their interests. They recognize this. Like if you, if you read the, um, all the industry journals, uh, even from the oil companies, they know that they are going into a territory that is extremely hostile to their interests. And so I think it raises this fascinating sort of historical, like cultural identity question about whether this region is going to become uh, the region I just got back from visiting in southern Louisiana, which is, um, uh, you know, it's tough. It's, it's very polluted. And, and it's, um, uh, it's not a region that I think most of us in this room would like to um, see replicated here. That's a, quite, that's a future for us, that's a possible future. The other future is um, that we tell them no, and when we tell them no, um, the act of not granting a permission slip, and again, there's complexity here, but on some level, it actually has global consequence. Those coal um, fields, they don't have a natural market unless they can get to the other side of the Pacific. The tar sands, on some level, has some of the same dynamic out of Canada. Bakken shale oil needs to get to the coast and move or it doesn't get used. Um, so what we decide to do with respect to handing them a permission slip or not isn't just about our local communities, it's about the whole future of the global climate. We have a huge, huge opportunity, I think. Thank you both.